Well, this is Lynn Fraser. I'm with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. And I'm really so happy today to be talking with Dr. Rick Jensen. And Good to uh, be with you, know, you again, Lynn. Yeah, thank you. You know, our interviews that we've done in the past have been so helpful for people. And you were one of the first people I thought of when, when the COVID-19 thing came. And I've been watching what you're doing online and referring people. So I just thought if you could give us a few ideas about you know, especially for people who are in recovery right now or who are struggling suddenly with a resurgence of craving or something like that. That's been so common too. Well, uh, I think it's the exact right question. And um, it gets at how can we practice with this? How can we both, you know, take action out in the world and take action inside our minds, including simply being with what we're feeling when we're feeling it. And this time uh, for many of us is full of um, obstructions to taking action out in the world, including simple things we used to do to find comfort. We would go to a bookstore or we would get together with some friends and have some coffee with friends, go to a physical meeting, let's say, in person with each other. Can't do that. So we are thrown back on ourselves more than ever. So as a psychologist they're, they're and a, a meditation teacher, there are things that for me are really central. And I'm just going to mention some major go-tos that I find really help. One is to um, uh, whew, calm and center. Just take that breath. Technically, if you extend the exhalation, you, nat you naturally calm, slow your heart rate. You engage the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. Two, three breaths in which the exhalation is longer than the inhalation. Calming. It helps to bring up kind of the body memory of feeling in some ways strong or enduring, determined, not a bunch of macho posturing, more like I can get through this, I've gotten through tough times in the past. What's it feel like to be determined? Maybe you start with feeling determined for someone else and then you tune into the feeling of it for yourself. Those are really important. Calming, centering, tuning into what feels strong. Second thing I think is really useful these days is to widen your perspective to see things to be thankful for. We're including things that are horrible, scary, we don't know, there's no positive thinking here, no rose colored glasses, no fake it till you make it. Right. We see that part, but the brain's negativity bias makes it like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones, tends to make us over-focus on, on the flashing red lights in the inner dashboard. So it's very important at this time, especially to not get trapped or bound to those negative stimuli um, that are real and, and keep the view wide. So what can we be thankful for? We can be thankful for good people like you, you know, offerings like this, the fact that you kind of water comes out of a pipe, clean water, like that's pretty great. Throughout history, nobody had water coming out of a pipe, just going like that, fresh water or, you know, music or nice people or, or those who have loved you or you look up at the stars or the, the children who are learning, the people, uh, the grass that is still growing, the flowers that are still blooming, the birds that are still chirping. Um, there are things we can be thankful for. And gratitude makes us stronger. Gratitude is not for chumps or like some yuppie frosting on the cake of life. It makes us stronger. A lot of research shows that gratitude, sense of meaning, sense of what we can be thankful for makes people more able to handle tough times, makes us resilient. Mm -hmm. Last one, contentment, in especially related to craving. So I, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I can watch my brain want more of those molecules, right? I don't, although I haven't, you know, done the full recovery process, I can definitely respect that process and rooted in my own meditative tradition, Buddhism, there's, you know, right up front is craving is the source of suffering. And it's that sense of something missing, something wrong. There's a place for wholesome desire. Desire per se is not the problem. We desire children to be fed. We desire that beings be happy. We desire to be held happy ourselves. No problem. It's when we get driven about it, pressured about it, demanding or intense or personalizing it. My precious right? That's when we get into yeah. trouble. So the alternative is to really explore the felt sense of contentment when it's available to you. Like for example, enoughness already in this breath. Is there enough air to breathe? 
is there going on being of the body? Not perfect, not great necessarily, still here. Can I be contented with still being here? Um, can I be contented with the good fortune that I've had, the privileges I have? Even people, certainly in the developed parts of the world, even those living in, real, in tough, tough, tough conditions are generally living better than the dukes and duchesses of 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know? Sure. Right? Yeah. yeah. So can I drop into that feeling of contentment? And as I drop into that feeling of contentment, I can still be ambitious. I can still try to do things. I can still speak truth to power. But underneath it all, there's an underlying feeling of enoughness. And that's my third suggestion. Calm strength, spacious gratitude, and uh, mindful contentment. Mm -hmm. They're available to us. I'm be really clear. We can do it. We can. Right? Yeah, yeah, you can do it. You, you have to bring a little focus to it, but it's available to us. It's totally available to us and no one can defeat us. These practices, all three of them that I named, no one can stop you. No one can do it for you either, which makes it real. Right, true. And the fact that somebody would be watching this is an indication that there's some kind of optimism there, some kind of trust that in fact we can do it. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. We'd be out doing drinking or doing something else or yeah. I know I, I feel that it, at this time, in a weird way, what could be called traditional values of self-reliance, mm -hmm. personal responsibility, and a kind of gritty, I think it was scruffy. I was joking earlier, I believe in the cockroach theory of life, keep crawling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you just keep going even if you don't have optimism even if you don't know there's something deep in your core that is just undefeatable yeah. and you can be smacked down right but in your core you know you're you start after the shock wears off and the grief wears off a little bit or abates a little bit then all right how can i practice with this what can i do about it what can i learn from it or how can i endure and how can i bring compassion to myself while i'm enduring that, right. that's a, yeah. it's like moxie Moxie's good. Right. <laughs> so one of the things that people are saying a lot is they don't know who to trust. And they're, people have so much trouble with the people who are making different decisions. So some people are making the decision that COVID is, mm. is a hoax and, and that people who believe in it are stupid. Other people are like, I have a compromised immune system. I can't just walk around with you not wearing a mask. So, and everything in between. What would you suggest as some way to kind of settle that so that there's not so much fear and anger and judgment? I think being in reality is the fundamental old fashioned virtue. My dad grew up on a ranch in North Dakota. They needed to know how many cattle they had. They needed to know if the cattle had food. They needed to know if, the, if diseases were killing their their animals. They needed to really be in reality. It's an absolutely fundamental value. And there are people whose jobs it is to be in reality, doctors and hospitals counting deaths and sources of deaths, public health officials, scientists, you know, journalists who are, are really trying to present facts and not just spin the news for some political purpose. And what these people tell us and it's highly credible when information comes from multiple relatively disinterested sources and they're all saying the same things. Lynn, you and I are talking on what is today, May 3rd or 4th, I forget. May 4th, yeah. May 4th, yeah. Today, 3,000 Americans will be killed by COVID-19. Yesterday, two you know, about 3,000. Yeah. Yesterday, about 2,000 Americans were killed by COVID-19. The day before that, the day before yesterday, 2,000 other Americans of us, right. in addition to those around the world, were killed by this disease. Um, that's a fact. Uh, current projections are easily from the White House, who are, you know, they're trying to minimize what's going to happen. Their, their projections are easily 100,000 to 240,000 Americans dead by the end of the year if we exercise full mitigation. That's the word from Deborah Burks. That's if we continue to practice social distancing. So 
let's be clear, this is a very contagious disease. It spares many people, although even for young people, it's like Russian roulette. Strange things happen. Doctors say, we, you know, this is a very unusual virus. It's hard to figure out. People, uh, frankly, your age and mine. Um, I don't know about you. I'm in my mid-60s, and people in, in my age group, certainly, who get this, roughly about 3% of them die. Right. right. Yeah, I'm in the same age group, too. Plus, I have yeah. asthma. Yeah. So what we do, f whatever we do today we'll see the results in two to three weeks. And where we're living with today is based on what happened two to three weeks ago. So it, to me, it's crystal clear, as every expert says, the fastest way out of this, the fastest way to the other side, including to reopening the economy and people going back to work again, is to don't stress the medical system with peaks of people having this. Test, 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 test. Trace, 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 trace. So if you get a positive test, you trace others and then isolate and support the people that have to be isolated. Otherwise, they pass it along. Um, right. There are many examples. Just recently, uh, I was reading, um, I think it was uh, in Nebraska, a small town somewhere. There was a, a kind of a party. Uh, maybe 50 people came to it. Uh, two of them turned out to have been contagious. Uh, and based on that single event, one event, and just two people, now a thousand people test positive for the coronavirus in that community a couple of weeks later. So I don't have much patience for people who uh, don't want to face the facts and who through their own actions put other people in peril. Uh, and I think, you know, we're back to old fashioned virtues, patience, delaying gratification, the greater good, charity, um, and not self-indulgence, not getting attached to all our conveniences. Yeah, maybe we're inconvenienced. It's a drag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a drag. But yeah. come on, we're talking about life and death consequences. My aunt in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, 98, is sitting in a nursing home. And uh, what people do outside that nursing home is life and death for her. Right. And so I think it's time to really face the common good and realize that if we are to be happy and successful, we need both to invest in ourselves individually, psychologically, as you teach and I teach as well. And we need to invest in the common good, including public health systems, science, respect for expertise, civil society, you know, a neutral justice system, no more rich man's law, poor man's law. Those are the things we need to do for the sake of our individual welfare, as well as obviously the greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's not political. This virus, no, it's not a red virus or a blue virus. <laughs> it's just a deadly a virus bad. that's coming at for all of us. Yeah. And uh, when people are casual about it, who are infectious, often long before they realize they're infectious, during that time, they are infecting everybody else. So you have it starts getting exponential. One person infects, you know, two people. Each of them infect two people, each of them infect two people, and it starts really small, and then wham, yeah. you've got people dropping dead all over. And let's remember, um, most of this was preventable. Most of this was anticipated by, the in America, the national security agencies in December and January and before. Uh, warnings were coming in, and we're in lockdown now because we didn't aggressively respond to the virus at the front end of this problem. And the great lesson of epidemics always people say, and many epidemics have come before, they're fairly predictable. Uh, in the beginning of them, uh, it seems like the steps you take are way over the top. Mm -hmm. By the midpoint, if not the end of it all, when you look back, those initial steps that struck everyone, or most people at first as like way over the top, were completely inadequate and should have been doubled have or tripled. Yeah. 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 And that's what we're going to see here, too. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems to be part of human nature that we don't see clearly or we don't rely on the experts early enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, <sighs> there's, you know, it's, it's a trivial example, but it's it's an own goal. It's shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, yeah. And. Uh, you know, all that said, my own view is, I mean, 
to be really blunt about it, if we had done nothing, you know, and just let everything spread starting in January and February and just ignored yeah. it, only ballpark 1% of Americans would have died by Christmas, let's say. Only 1%, right? Which is 3 million people when, right? Even with strong efforts now, think about the death toll, probably a couple hundred thousand ballpark, including the excess deaths, the, the coronavirus deaths that are not counted because they didn't know why they died, but they really did die from coronavirus. And also the deaths that occurred because people didn't get adequate medical care because right. the coronavirus had flooded the system. So these are the deaths that are caused by this illness, this right. plague. It's a plague, this plague spreading among us, easily 200,000 by the end of the year. Well, yeah. that 200,000 is four times the death toll of the Vietnam War in one year. Right. Not 19 years of the Vietnam War, one year, 200,000 excess, largely unnecessary American deaths, as well as the enormous toll on the economy. And it's really important to recognize the scale of this. Right, yeah. And then to do something to downregulate our nervous system. That's exactly right. I can feel myself getting fiery about it. Yep. And that's yep. okay. Part it of is. part of coping is firing us without, yep. you know, lose without letting hatred poison your heart. Right. That's so important. Yep. And to allow that. And then to recover really rapidly. So I'd say a lot of the point of my own training, you know, and what I've done is to increase the recovery rate which is one of the major markers of resilience. It's not so much how much do we react initially. Also, we have temperaments and um, I have a Scottish heritage. We're calm for a while until <laughs> you know, we get fiery. And so, uh, but the real question is how fast can you recover? Can exactly. you come back to baseline and not do a lot of damage along the way? Like not have to go and get drunk to calm down again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. And meanwhile, I think your point is exactly right. Uh, see clearly, see what my phrase is, think, see globally, act locally. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to see the bigger picture, right? You know, which transcends political party. It's just about protection and competence right. and truth telling and responsibility and right. not being selfish, lazy, and uncaring, right? Yeah. It's about that. Uh, and then locally, what are we doing today? You know, uh, my rule as a guy who's done a lot of really dangerous things in wilderness, stay safe today. Right. By tomorrow, they, the doctors, the scientists are going to know a little more. Stay safe tomorrow and don't hurt anyone today or tomorrow. Don't pass anything bad onto anything else. And so it means living in the light today, right? Mm -hmm. Living in virtue today and taking refuge in the knowing that you've been impeccable more or less today. Right. And you do it again tomorrow. Yeah. If yeah. I could be slightly fiery again, you know, one of the things for me that um, has stood out from this time is it's expanded my range of recognizing just kind of how horrible some people can be and how fantastic, steadfast, right. dedicated, and courageous some other people can be. And mm -hmm. to me, I'm going to put it in a kind of a blunt way. Looking around, we see that people can be shitty and people can be noble. Right. Choose noble. Right. Yeah. Honor it in them. Mm -hmm. Do the best you can to step up to it yourself and then take refuge in the knowing of your own effort today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. So let's just give people an idea of where they can uh, connect with you. I know you're doing a lot of free yeah. online programs. Oh, yeah. a new uh, my website is great, rickhanson.net. My son and I have a wonderful podcast, Being yeah. Well. A lot of people listen to it. We talk with each other sometimes. We also have really great guests from time to time. And if I may say so, I'm so happy about this. My book just is coming out. Oh. Neurodharma. And basically what it's about is using both science and perennial wisdom in very practical ways every day to heal, to self-actualize, and to progress in whatever your own personal path of awakening is. 
uh, for the sake of others as well as yourself. So that's kind of really happy and the, the cover kind of says it all. But yeah. I would say those things, that's how people can know more about it. Right. Oh, and I have an online program uh, for the book that's highly accessible. It's very experiential, came out of a meditation retreat I taught. Um, and it's, it's really inexpensive for what it is, especially. And if someone is in real financial need, we love giving scholarships to it. Oh. So for me, it's kind of the Robin Hood approach. I'm perfectly happy for people who could afford, you know, uh, a couple yeah. hundred bucks for a program, while also people who really can't are enabled to have access to it by all those people who purchase it. Right, right, good. Yeah. And I know you have some free, are you still streaming your meditations? On oh, Wednesday? well, you have so many free things. So <laughs> the podcast is free. Every Wednesday night, I do a streamed meditation gathering. Several hundred people, at least, are usually involved in it. Um, and um, gosh, a YouTube channel. I've started doing more things. Facebook Live on Thursdays at noon, one rather, Pacific time. So a lot of good things. A lot of good ways for people to access freely this, this, these, this material that comes through me to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for getting together. Yeah. And I'm happy that you got a little fiery. I think it's a fiery time right now and we need to be in touch with that too, you know? Yeah, I think when we're here, I mean, as a bit of a reflection at the end, as long as we were all propped up by our situations and activities and interactions and the experiences we were having at the time, you know, the music's playing and the sun is shining, it's all kind of good. But when the bottom falls out, when a storm comes, you know, we saw this storm coming, Epidemics are predictable. Hurricanes are predictable. There are details that vary, but we saw this sucker coming our way in early January, and now here we are. And it's going to be with us for a while, and its consequences will be with us for even longer. All right. So when the storm is upon us and the music stops playing and the bottom falls out, we are left with whatever it is we have grown inside us and between us. And a big lesson here is the importance of programs like yours or my own efforts as ways to grow lasting traits inside us, not just propping ourselves up with states, with experiences, but developing trait, happiness, love, wisdom, compassion, grit, resilience, insight, and so forth. That's a real takeaway. And I think we see a similar takeaway at the level of the common good, community, society, you know, and so forth, when we don't invest in public health systems, if we don't respect science, if we don't respect real journalism, real news, if we don't respect um, the rule of law, if we don't respect fair play, you know, standards for one group need to be standards for the other group. Mm -hmm. um, when we don't respect that, everything's fine until the storm comes, more or less. But when the storm comes and you've hollowed out the common good, it's... Yeah blown out of the water. And that's what we're seeing. So my hope is one of the gains amidst all the losses of this time will be a, a new clarity about the importance of investing in oneself and the development of, of virtuous qualities inside that are helpful and, and worthy, as well as the importance of, of valuing anew and, in, and investing more in the common good, the good we share with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly my hope too. And we're seeing that a lot. We're seeing both sides really extremely right now, but we're certainly yeah, seeing good too. That's correct. Yeah, That's correct. There's nothing like um, knowing that as we speak here, people are dying from this illness yeah. that uh, did not need to die. And here we are. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be here tomorrow too. Right. It's a sober, speaking of sobriety, it's right. a sobering reflection on the truth of things. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, Lynn. Yeah, yeah thank and you. And blessings to you and to everyone watching or listening. The Killaby Center for Recovery is reaching out to some of the people we've interviewed for the Radical Recovery Summit. We're asking, how can you support people that are struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic? There is a range of programs and support that people are offering, as well as ways to frame this. What is it that's happening inside of you during this time? Come to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to click right through to the interviews.